Once upon a time, there was a woman named Olivia who married a man named Lee. And the Lord blessed them with two sons. And they lived in Los Angeles in a neighborhood known as Pacific Palisades. And they joined a conservative synagogue in Los Angeles called Adat Shalom. Robin and Nate, our members, have family at Adat Shalom. I have family. My sisters go to Adat Shalom every Shabbos. Uh, I've been there for life cycle events of my family there. So this family joins Adat Shalom. And Olivia and Lee's two sons enroll in the Hebrew school at Adat Shalom. And they start getting trained for their bar mitzvahs at Adat Shalom. And one day, they say to their parents, Dear mother, dear father, we have a request. Can we please play tackle football? And the parents say, No, you have to get ready for your bar mitzvah. And they say, Well, okay, but after our bar mitzvah, can we play tackle football? And they say, we'll see. <laughs> and there's a beautiful photograph of these pious young lads. They're wearing their talasim. They're flanked by their very proud parents. They're photographed right opposite the Aron Kodesh, the Holy Torah with the Ark open and the Sefer Torah is gleaming. And this picture of pious lads and talais and parents, ark, Torahs, many of us have our own family equivalent of those photos, and they have their bar mitzvah. And then afterwards, sure enough, they start playing tackle football for the Pacific Palisades Dolphins. And both boys have Hebrew names. The older one is Gedalia Yitzchak, and the younger one is named Mendel. So they start playing, and at first, the mother, Olivia, is concerned that her sons were going to get hurt. After all, football is a contact sport. But soon she realizes her concern is not that her sons are going to get hurt. Her concern is that her sons are going to hurt the other players. Because both boys are blessed by the Lord with size. <laughs> Already in the ninth grade, they're each over six feet tall. They weigh lots of weight. They're much bigger. <laughs> they're much stronger. They're much sturdier than any other player on the field. And the mother famously observed that they were like trucks moving around little cars. <laughs> and watching, she felt that perhaps her sons found their destiny, and perhaps their destiny was football. Well, roll the film forward. And one fine day, the Cleveland Browns are drafting in the NFL. And Cleveland's team is, always does poorly, and so they always have a high draft. And so, in their second pick, which is the 37th overall pick, there's a big Cleveland Browns party, a draft party. They're going to get the stars for the next year. They're going to finally lead the team to salvation. And the announcer announces, for the 37th pick, with their second round draft choice, the Cleveland Browns announced the selection of Mitchell Schwartz. And there's a collective groan and a collective response that Mitchell Schwartz sounds like a CPA, <laughs> not like a football player. <laughs> but it turns out that Mitchell Schwartz and his brother Jeff Schwartz both became offensive linemen in the NFL. And while Jeff Schwartz had an OK career, he had an OK career, he started, he did fine. His brother Mitchell, otherwise known as Mendel, was a bona fide star. He starts for the Kansas City Chiefs offensive line. 
Mitchell Schwartz is responsible for protecting Patrick Mahomes, the star quarterback. And what's remarkable about this is that in a game where a lot of players are injured a lot of the time, especially linemen, he's never missed a game. And in fact, he's the highest rated player in the postseason of everybody who played in the postseason, including Patrick Mahomes. Mitchell Schwartz, highest rated player. So they were interviewing his father, Lee, and they said, Lee, when you watch your son play football, what do you think? And his answer is just so perfect. He said, when I watch both of my sons play football, I just quell. <laughs> so let's talk about quell. So first of all, of course, it's a Yiddish word, and I did a little bit of quick and dirty research on quell. And quell comes from the German word, which means to gush and to spring forth. And so kvel means to be bursting with pride. So here's my question. How do we kvel for our loved ones? What causes us to look at our loved ones' lives, and the choices they make, the lives they are leading, and to be bursting with pride? Now, if your son is six foot five and 320 pounds, and plays for the Kansas City Chiefs and wins the Lombardi Trophy? Okay, so you fell. But I've done some research, and it turns out that relatively few of our families have children in the NFL. <laughs> Very few of our children grow up to be offensive linemen. So for the rest of us, how then do we fell? And it turns out that felling, if you want felling, it's very complicated. Because there is a secret sauce for kvelling. And it's a complex recipe. Because kvelling consists of two different ingredients. And both ingredients are in creative tension with one another. And both of these ingredients are summoned by our Torah reading today, the giving of, of the Ten Commandments at Sinai. Here's the first ingredient in the complex mix of kvelling for your children and loved ones. Here it is. That is the affirmation of individual variability, the celebration of total diversity, that there are, there's not one kind of intelligence, there are multiple kinds of intelligences, and kvelling is about celebrating them all, and we learned that from the giving of the Torah at Sinai. In his classic book, The Healer of Shattered Hearts, David Wolpe quotes this midrash, which says that when God gave the Torah to the Jewish people at Sinai, God knew one size does not fit all, because Jews, like all people, are very different from one another. And so God knew, according to this midrash, I got to give different things to different people so that everybody can accept and hear and act on and own this message of Torah. So for the intellectuals, God gave ideas. And for the emotional people, God gave feeling. For musical people, God gave song. For people who loved to dance, God gave movement. For people who liked calm, God gave mellow. For the people who like intensity, God gave urgency. God gave every person what they needed to live this. One size does not fit all for revelation. And if you have kids, you know that one size does not fit all for parenthood. The classic in this field is called Far From the Tree by Andrew Solomon. And he writes about the differences between parents and children, which are often vast. And he begins his book with a very famous observation. There is no such thing as reproduction, only production. There's no such thing as reproduction, only production, because if you bring a child into the world or if you adopt a child, you're not bringing into the world or adopting a clone who's just like the parents. Rather, they're somebody who's independent, has their own mind, has their own soul. 
And so the first ingredient of kvelling is to be genuinely happy that your child has found their thing, even if their thing is most definitely not your thing. Can you do that? Can you be deeply okay with? Can you, in fact, celebrate? Can you be actually happy that your child has found their thing, even if their thing is just totally not your thing? That's the first ingredient of kvelling. And I learned this from a very important non-Jewish source, a Netflix video series called Cheer. Cheer and I watched this six-part series on Cheer. Cheer is a sport. For those of you who don't know what Cheer is, it's, it's a sport where you have athletes who are super talented. And this series is about the cheer squad at Navarro Junior College. Navarro Junior College is in Texas, and they are a dynasty. They win the National Junior College Tournament competition year after year in Daytona, Florida. And the series is six hours about what is it like to be on a cheer squad, which is intense and intensely successful. So it's a co-ed squad, so the base are men, and the men are responsible for sending into the air their female colleagues who are called flyers, base and flyers. And it takes a lot of athleticism. If you're on the base, you have to be strong enough to be able to lift another human being and send her into the air. And if you're one of the flyers, you also have to be totally agile, and they whirl, and they twirl, and they flip, and they come down. So it requires strength and agility and trust because you're high up in the air and you got to trust that your teammate's going to catch you, which happens a lot. <laughs> but not always. And when it doesn't happen, you know, some serious and worse than serious injuries ensue. So we watch this for six hours. And I'll tell you why I was fascinated by cheer, just at the human level. I, I don't actually do it. <laughs> but I'll tell you why I found this fascinating. Because they do profiles of all these athletes, both the bases and the flyers. And here's what was so remarkable to me. They wake up in the morning and they're thinking, cheer, 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 cheer. I'm going to do cheer. I'm going to do cheer. Their whole life is cheer. They don't actually do any schoolwork. They just do cheer. And what's so interesting is not one person comes from a family that does cheer. Not one person said, oh, I want to do cheer because my mother did cheer. Not one person said, I want to do cheer because my father did cheer. Every one of these athletes found cheer on their own. It was their thing. It was not their parents' thing. And so that's the first element of kvelling. Can you cheer when your kid finds their thing, even if you're like scratching your head, where did that come from? But it's their thing and you're happy for them. But now this is why kvelling is a complex recipe. Because here's what cuts against that is in creative tension with it. Kvelling is also about, and Sinai is also about, the transmission of values from generation to generation that this is a value that's important to me, your parent. And I want to transmit this value intact and in love to you, the next generation. I want you to take this value and live it on your own and make it live in another generation. After all, the Ten Commandments are not just God saying, love all of you who are just who you are. The Ten Commandments are God also saying, it's great that you can all hear the Ten Commandments, but I expect you to do all the laws of the Torah. So here's my question for you. Can you have both? Can you affirm individual variability, individual uniqueness, multiple personality types, and can you still at the same time somehow get in that same package the transmission of values from great-grandparents to grandparents to parents to children to grandchildren to great-grandchildren. Can you get individuality and transmission of values at the same time? So, this past week, a very wonderful man 
completely inspiring man named Herb Epstein was laid to his eternal rest. I just want to acknowledge his daughters, Deborah and Judy, who are sitting where Herb and Jean always sat every Shabbos. And Herb died at the age of 94. And his kids during this week were going through his personal effects. And they found something that was remarkable. So he himself was a first generation American. And his parents were both immigrants. They came to this country from the Ukraine. And what his children found during the days before his funeral was the original of his bar mitzvah speech, which he gave in 1939. Okay? He's born in 1926. He merges to his adulthood, his Jewish adulthood, in 1939. We're on the eve of the Holocaust. We're on the eve of World War II. We're in the shadow, the age of Adolf Hitler. And this child of immigrants, this child of Ukrainian immigrants, takes the pulpit for his bar mitzvah. And as a 13-year-old, this is what Herb Epstein says. He says, my family's only here because our country let us in. I'm only here standing before you now because our country let us in. And I'm young and I'm beginning my adulthood. And so here's what I want to do. I want to pay this forward to other families. When there are other families who are seeking welcome, that's what I want to devote my life to. He's 13 years old. So it turns out he'd have to wait a while to be able to do that. He gets married to Jean. They have four kids, daughters and Charlie and Eli. He's got to provide for his kids. So he ends up getting a job as a corporate attorney, and he works doing corporate attorney work for 40 years. And it's a good job, and he provides for his family, but he isn't able to do this value work that was so compelling to him. Then he retires, and he spends the next 30 years, the entirety of his retirement, trying to help asylum seekers gain asylum representing them in the courts. He gets trained up, how do you help an asylum seeker with their case in court? He spends 30 years doing that. And at his funeral here in the Gan Chapel this week, one of his legal aid colleagues who had worked with him for only 20 years of the 30 years, said in the 20 years that he did this work representing asylum seekers in the courts, Herb Epstein personally saved the lives of a thousand people at least, and he saved a thousand families. His desire to do this was delayed, but not denied. Now here's what's so remarkable. Think of Kfell. Affirmation of individual variability, affirmation of transmission of values, how does this work? So Herb and Jean's four children are all very different from one another. One is an architect, one is a theater director, one is a mathematics professor, one is a musician, very different from one another. Because the beginning of Far From the Tree is true, there is no such thing as reproduction, only production. Every person finds their thing, we hope, and that's the way it should be. But at the same time, all four kids and all the grandkids said, wow, our father, our grandfather, he had this through line from the age of 13 to the age of 94. He had this through line. He stood for something. He had a value. He couldn't do it right away. He had to work, had to provide for his kids, had to get them into college and provide for them. But he had something about which he would not be denied. He had an area of work, he had an idea, he had an ideal, he had a value. I will not be denied. Delayed, maybe for 40 years, but not denied 30 years 
A third of his life he devoted to this. And all of his children and grandchildren said, yeah, we need to do that. We need to find our own through line, our own idea, our own ideal about which we will not be denied. Yes to individual variability. And yes to the transmission of sacred values from generation to generation. And when both of those things happen, we can all fell. Shabbat Shalom.